I'm wondering if, if you would all like to come back up for a few minutes of Q&A. Sure. Okay. I Cheers. That? Okay. Do, you, do you want to sit or would you rather stay? Stay up here. Okay. so new that I don't even have the name quite right yet. So the Washington Alliance for Gun Responsibility will be meeting with people statewide. And we're hoping that more of these kinds of discussions can take place. But we're also going to be take, bringing the groups together to talk with our legislators. And there are some right now, as I think both these gentlemen had mentioned, that uh, they are feeling really beleaguered within their own districts. Um, Mike Hope, up in the 44th district, who is a Republican, is just getting lambasted by um, the gun lobby right now, uh, with things flooding in his district. So we're going to be working with and asking people to contact your legislators. And I think, Nick, you're probably going to be talking more about this. But the most important thing that we're going to be able to do is to reach the legislators and tell, tell them how we feel. Now, your question about others that may disagree with us, they're the doors have got to be open. We are absolutely going to have to get people together to say, what is it? How do we differ? But where's that common ground? And that's going to take us time. And it's going to take whatever we can do this legislative session and next legislative session. But for those of us that have contacts with our legislators, we need to make them. And if we have siblings or we've got friends in, in districts, such as Mike Hope, say, call them and let them know and contact Mike Hope and tell him that he has support. That's really critical right now. Do you want me to monitor? Um, I, I, I can yeah. actually stand up. <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much for getting us all together, Jessica. Um, this is phenomenal of getting together on this topic. And I also want to thank you very much for shifting the conversation away from gun control to safety and uh, responsibility, because I think that's where we need to be talking, not about controlling, but about responsibility and safety. And I think that's a lot more powerful. And I also want to thank you very much for bringing up the issue of um, safety in regards to the children that died last year. There were three of them that died because guns were left unsecured and there were four and five year olds that you know, killed their siblings. And um, I have a five year old and I have twins that are three and, and these things really touch my heart. Of, I, it just, it's insane that we allow this to be so unsafe and that in one case it was a police officer who left his gun in his car and it was his child who killed his other child. And it just, can you imagine? This safety issue to me needs to be uh, worked on and I really appreciate you. Um, changing the conversation and focusing on that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very important point uh, about the framing of this issue. Uh, gun control is a phrase that's gone in history. The Supreme Court ruling was absolutely clear that the Second Amendment allows uh, ownership of weapons in our country. And they also said gun safety and reasonable regulations, as Nick was saying, is something that is reasonable and we can do that. So we need to not use the phrase gun control, because all that does is um, push the old buttons and get people all engaged, and it becomes a worthless conversation. So thank you very much. Good um, Nick, you were saying that the majority of shooters, public were in, that you've seen, were ineligible to have weapons. And yet one of the things we're, we're pushing for is, is uh, background checks. So there's a gap there between actually stopping the violence and, and what the laws can do. Yes. There's no answer to this question at all, but I'm just like, what I'm thinking yeah. after is find a way of uh, breaking that gap down and I hope the right is. Well, again, a lot of it goes really back to gun safety because, again, those, the majority of those who would be considered ineligible to possess, um, possess a weapon are possessing stolen weapons. And so, where they're getting the guns are getting in the burglaries and the car problems. And that means folks are leaving guns under their beds, under, you know, I mean, the burglars know where to look for guns. And, and, and people hide them in the same places. Um, and so, you know, getting an approved gun safe, um, or at least at minimum trigger locks, um, is, is really important. And our, our Dan Satterberg, who is our prosecuting attorney in King County, is really moving towards 
those kinds of rules too, and talking about those from a safety standpoint. What the feds have told us is that over the years, 1.5 million people had applied, but through gun background checks, were not able to get guns. So we know the background checks work. Are they the end all be all? No way. But is it a step in the right direction? Yes. And that's what we're looking at. Is this, you know, unfortunately, it's just baby steps, but it's really important. And then if we can get people to say, all right, what else should we be doing? Locking them up, making sure that. And I just learned from somebody in the last few days that said you can have a little gun uh, locker in your room that opens up only with your with your handprint. Only you can open that up. And so, you know, we start thinking about this as, as back like to what Tim was saying with the seatbelts or secondhand smoke. It just changed, you know, our minds change about what we can do to keep each other safe. Uh, on a national level, <coughs> do you think the Congress is ready to pass just the, of just the uh, background checks? What's, what's the sense of whether or not they would do that? I know they don't do anything else, but is there a sense that they may be ready to do that? Background checks? That would be you know, they might. I just read uh, last week in the New York Times uh, hints from the NRA that that's something they might trade. Don't do assault weapons, don't do magazine clips, don't do this, don't do that. But fine, we'll give you universal background checks. And that's actually a rather depressing commentary on <laughs> yeah. the, the state of uh, political leadership in our country. But I think also just building on what Tim's saying is that if we can do something in our state and Colorado can do something in its state and New York, that pretty soon that it's just like with gay marriage. It's like, well, yes. I mean, why would you not? I mean, this and that's this is again the changing the culture. So I think it'll be um, it's going to have to be incremental. Uh, but that's one of the reasons I'm working so hard locally because it's something that we can at least impact. We can impact it better here than we can back in Washington. I want to say one more thing about that, and, and your question actually brings this up. And this is, you know, I don't like saying this, but we have a culture of violence in our country. And we, we have the highest rate of gun violence of any industrialized country. I mentioned Australia and UK, but you look at any of the other uh, countries who are not culturally close to us. Um, and we have to address that issue as well. Um, violence is something that you know, we, we talk about the American West and the Wild West and, hey, wasn't that cool and all that. We live with um, a culture of violence and I think we need to be willing to confront that. And the best way to confront that, in my opinion, is through the public health lens. Because that brings credibility, that brings evidence, that brings facts. Um, everybody loves their doctor, usually. And it just, it just it puts it in a different discussion, uh, a different frame, a different field of discussion. And so that's, I hope you will all encourage that uh, locally. And the other thing I'll say, you know, Nick's comment about guns are often stolen and that's where they're being used. That's why we need mandatory theft and loss reporting, because that's not the case today. And again, a reasonable, practical regulation that helps keep everyone safe, not, not just those of us in this room, but even NRA members uh, who deserve to be safe too. So that's why we need to keep moving in those directions. So I did have a question. So um, I know that Mike Cohen was mentioned, and I actually did send an email to him thank you. And he responded back saying that um, he did support the bill, but with the caveat that the records are expunged after 30 days. I, I don't know a lot about the government. Do you still feel that that's an effective bill? I mean, is, is, is the background check served just for those 30 days if, if we never keep any, any track of who? From, from my standpoint, um, I would like to see the registry in place, but I also know that it may be a losing battle at this point. So if I can take something and get people to say, yes, this is the direction we're moving, then next year we can add on to that. So I'm, I, I guess, an incrementalist, I'll take something, um, even though I'd like to have something much different, much bigger, and I'd like to be able to go after assault weapons and magazines and all of this simultaneously. Um, so, Sally, you talk about the assault weapons, and I realize that assault weapons, well, one, we're not sure what they are. That's a definition. definition. And two, they're responsible only for a small number of crimes. But the criticism of the federal assault weapons ban is, oh, it, you know, it didn't accomplish anything to reduce weapon ownership. It's because there was, what, six months for people to stockpile weapons and ammunition. Is there, 
I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of guns and there's a lot of ammunition already out there. Is there anything that we can do to deal with that problem? Even you know, or has has the horse already left the barn? Well, I think that I think we got a lot of horses galloping down the road. Um, <laughs> but uh, at the town we hall, we need to be on those horses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the town hall meeting three weeks ago, it was very interesting to me because I was to, I was speaking and I spoke after four or five public health experts, and I was the only one up there that didn't have an MD or PhD behind my name. Um, but what I really appreciated at, at that event is that there was somebody in the audience, and, and I said, you don't take an assault weapon to, shoot, weapon to shoot a deer. You don't use an assault weapon to go duck hunting. And I really respect the culture that we have of hunting and feeding our families in this country. And I said, the only thing that I know of that an assault weapon is used for is to attack humans. And the guy in the back was just incensed. He said, you lie, you lie. So at the end of it, we talked with him and said, OK, what else would you use an assault weapon for? And he said, target practice. That he's a vet, and he, he, has, he plays a game, he said, and it's three different pistols and three different types. And I said, OK, I stand corrected. The only thing I know that we use assault weapons for are target practice and killing human beings. Um, but then somebody else brought up the issue of, would you do what Germany does, which is take your assault weapons and lock them up at the place where you are playing your game, whatever it is. That the assault weapons are banned on the streets, but you can take them and lock them up in a place where you can use them. And then apparently you can take them home and you can lock them up in your home. But, that, well, you know, at least the conversation is starting. And I heard from this guy and I believe that he was genuine when he said he's a vet and this is what he really enjoys. To your point, um, and that's why I think things like this are so important because you know ninety percent of people they say support universal background checks, but that's a poll and it's meaningless. So if you don't contact your legislator, if you don't do something about it, they can't act on that. And I don't know the exact staff, but there was a great show or um, uh, an NPR where they were talking about gun rights activists versus gun responsibility activists and the amount of um, it's 25% and like 20% of gun rights activists call their congressperson every day and send money to their groups versus gun responsibility advocates, 5% call and 3% give money. So, you know, everybody wants it, but if you talk about it with your friends or you Facebook it, it doesn't matter until you call somebody and make your point heard. And to me, that's the simplest thing to do here is get groups together, get people together, and get our voice heard. It's not radical, it's not insane, it's common sense, and most people agree about it. So, that's <laughs> Well, I can tell you, at least from the standpoint of doing the background checks, that's a huge question that would be is looming out there because law enforcement can't do the background checks for, uh, at, le at least as a police department, we can't do the background checks for them. So, um, you know, either either ATF has to step up and do that, or I don't know, that maybe it goes privatized or something like that. As far as the enforcement, that probably would fall to the feds on a federal level, or you know, because I mean, at, at least at this point in time. Most law enforcement, law enforcement agencies aren't going to have the capacity to be able to do that enforcement. So either there'd have to be some you know, huge restructuring of, of law enforcement agencies or there'd have to be a component of ATF or some other, or if it's statewide, some other statewide organization or agency. Yeah. Are you guys, at what point in the legislation did you Agencies meaning who's going to do the background yeah, check? Yeah, exactly. yeah. So if, if the legislature in our state were, were to adopt universal background checks, they would at the same time have to address how are we going to do this? Because uh, next right, there's not a system that's in place to do that today. If you're a licensed gun dealer, it's because you're a federal licensed gun dealer, and so the federal authorities have a system where the licensed gun dealer does the background check through that system. 
there's not a state or local system that exists today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Zach Silk. And for those of you who know Zach, um, Zach really brought people together around R74, and R74 was what just passed the legislature, passed as an initiative. That's a rough road, for God's sake. Um, this past November, that allowed couples to marry in our state. So we've hired him. We've got some great lobbyists, and I think Nick's either part of it or connected with it. So we'll hear more from Nick, but we really do have the beginning. But it is only a beginning. What you were saying about functioning as clearly as the MRA. But you know, they've been around for however many years, 50, 60 years. And they used to be focused on on, on hunting. And on safety. And on safety. <laughs> and getting people and, and in order to use a gun, we took a gun safety program that the NRA endorsed. Um, and things have shifted. So like you said, we just need to stick together on this and really go. Um, my name's Cheryl and I'm a gun shooting survivor. And I just sure, why do you stand up here. and come, yeah, come on, tell them. Yeah. Um, well, tell all of us what happened. Uh, I was, I'm one of the survivors of the Jewish Federation shooting. And um, about a week before Sandy Hook happened, I made the decision, my, my shooting, my shooting um, happened uh, six and a half years ago in July of 2006. It's taken me that long to be okay with being public about being a victim and a survivor and being um, an advocate for uh, gun safety and responsibility and finding middle ground on this issue. Um, as you can imagine, it's been a pretty emotional issue, um, even within my own family. My dad was an NRA member until this past November, had been most of his life. Um, so I, you know, I've struggled with this on a lot of different levels. But one thing I want to encourage everybody to do is um, if you know people, or if you think you know people, maybe know some people who have been affected by gun violence, encourage them to step forward, come out of the closet, if you will. I think that a lot more of us know people, but we don't know it, that have been affected by this. And uh, I think if we can kind of uh, realize how many people around us every day are affected by it, uh, it's going to encourage a lot of more people to come forward for the cause. The more neighbors, friends, family members we know who've been affected. I, one woman I know who's a friend of my sister's in Oregon, I've known her for 25 years, and I didn't find out until I came out about this publicly last month that she was a victim of gun violence. She was almost shot by her father when she was a teenager and snuck out of the house to meet her boyfriend, and she came back in, and her father thought she was a burglar. And if her mom hadn't turned the light on, her father probably would have killed her. So. That was something that she had lived with and had never talked about. There's a lot of shame associated with it. Um, there's a lot of guilt if you're a survivor uh, and somebody that you know with didn't survive. So um, anything you can do to help people like me be comfortable talking about it and then helping other people hear those stories, I think will help. Thank you. Thank you.